Okay. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I appreciate y'all being customers. Really do. Uh, we've had great relationships. I have a lot of people I recognize in, in the room that we've worked with for many years. So also thank KMC, great company. I remember the, the, the family company from pneumatic actuators, right? Back in the day when they, you know, the great pneumatic actuator, now look how far it's come. So I think that's pretty cool to see a family business kind of move that way. So really glad to be here. So I, I'm going to talk today about a little bit about product update, what's new within four, talk a little bit about Niagara Cloud and Niagara Analytics, but it's kind of open, so I'm open to any questions. I mean, most of the people know me, you're not gonna ask me a question that's gonna bother me. Uh, feel free to ask questions afterwards. Uh, so, so I'm gonna do my spill, and then uh, Nicole from Cochran's gonna come up and talk about uh, IT networking and OT networks and those sort of things. So we're gonna kind of dovetail two presentations here. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So. Uh, some of the key Tritium members that are here, Nick Kerr, who's on my team, is here uh, walking the building. and used to work for KMC, so knows a lot of people here. Uh, again, I'm the channel leader, but we're also going to be at ASHRAE. So if you're staying along for ASHRAE at booth 3820, all our key executives will be there. Uh, James Johnson, if you know James, one of the best technical experts in the world for Niagara. So if you have a technical question and you really need to know about it, that is the person you want to track down, and a host of others. We have a lot of our development engineers that are here this year, so it's, it's pretty exciting time. So we, we have a lot of people, so please come on by the booth, and a lot of things I'll show you today, we'll go into deep dive demos at the booth during ASHRAE. So, so what's uh, really cool, the Niagara framework is still growing. As of uh, December, we had 642,000 instances of Niagara out there. So it growing still pretty good, pretty steady. So. Uh, and growing every day for, because of partners like you. So nice little uh, numbers that we kind of keep track of. Uh, so again, so I'm going to go right into the Niagara 4 update, what's new. But I want to talk first about AX. You know, we've, we've had three major revisions of Niagara framework. We had R2, which in the early days, which we still have a lot of partners that have R2 out there. As a matter of fact, last year, we changed out hundreds of systems because of our upgrade program, and there's still R2 which actually went away in 2005, and the systems are still running, very robust. AX has been around for many years, which came out in 2005, so that's 10 years. Uh, we've announced end of life in a couple of years for AX, so, and now we're moving on to N4. But <clears throat> what we've done, just to let you know, there is a nice migration path from AX to N4, okay? We didn't do a great job in our two days to do that, but we, we understood for AX we had to be able to do that. So, so basically, you can actually put a Niagara 4 supervisor on top of your AX system. Okay, so you can bring in all those points, you can learn them, you can do the graphics. As a matter of fact, you can have your AX supervisor and N4 supervisor together. So a lot of people are saying, I'm gonna start off with a supervisor and I'm gonna slowly move my system over to be able to do that. The other thing you can do is you can actually run Niagara 4 in older AX JSONs. Now you do have to be careful because Niagara 4 has got a lot more power, uses some more memories, but you could actually take the existing JCs you have and run Niagara in them if you want to do that as an option. However, <coughs> we have the new JC8000 super powerful platform. You know, everybody's talking about IoT and, and all that. The, the chips are so inexpensive now and we can put so much power in one platform that we recommend that people do that. A lot of people, last year we did a trade up program where people could trade in their old JSONs and upgrade to be able to do that. So super powerful platform. Uh, <clears throat> but again, the other option I told you about is we still want you to be able to have N4 and AX JSONs on the same system, okay? Again, we saw how many hundreds of thousands of instances are out there. There's still a lot of systems and it's gonna take many years for those AX systems to, to, to move out of the system. Uh, the other option is if you have AX and the JACE goes bad, you can actually buy a new platform and run the old software in it if you want to do that. So if you have an AX JACE that goes bad, I recommend to you replace it with the new JACE 8000, and then later on when you want to upgrade, all you do is change, the, you know, do the upgrade program to be able to do that. Now we've got a lot of tools that will convert your AX system uh, to N4. And we have a lot of ways that are still compatible. So it's a, it's, it's a lot less tedious to upgrade a system than it used to be. So I encourage your, your engineers, if they have questions about that, we have online training that to tells you how to do some of these, these upgrades and those sort of things up on the, on the Tritium training site. So, so let's talk about 4.4 and beyond, what's going on. We just came out with a release of software called Niagara 4.4. And that is our, what we call long-term release. And I want to explain that those, remember those AXJSs I said that run N4? Well, it's important that we're gonna have a build that will run with those forever. Now, sooner or later, as processors 
and, and software gets more powerful, those older hardware platforms just aren't going to work with some future builds, right? So as we go to Niagara 5 and that, but Niagara 4.4 is going to be a long-term release for seven years. And that's just because we want to make sure that older platforms are out there will have support for a reasonable period of time. So, that, so typically that 4.4 will be there and then when we go to 4.5, 4.6 or go to 5, 4.4 will be a long-term release that we support. That means we'll be doing cyber patches, we'll be doing you know, bug fixes and those sort of things for long term. So it's, it's, a, it's a nuance, but it's very important to your end user customers if they have some older hardware platforms out there. One of the new features that we're doing is something called single sign-on. You might also call it SAML authentication. So if you have some very uh, sophisticated end users and they want to have one single sign-on and get to all their JSONs without going to multiple authentication, we now support that. You're going to have people like banking uh, institutions that want to do that. People like, the, the, like Ford and, and, and major enterprises. It's a really important feature that we have. Yes, sir? It is. So that's, a, that's a different feature, but I'm glad you brought up LDAP because we supported LDAP for years. But it's an authentication where if somebody wants to sign on, it will route them through to all their JSONs. And it uses uh, w the, the, uh, uh, an existing SAML authentication scheme. Without getting a lot of IT talk, if, if somebody's using SAML today, they have a special server that does authentication, and we connect to that. So. Again, we could spend an hour just talking about SAML, and I'm not the one to talk about it, to be honest with you, but that, it's, it's important to note. Certainly, if you have, have that wish with you, or, or an issue with it, give us a call. Would so. you promote SAML over LDAP? No, it's two different things. You would do two, I, I wouldn't, because I think it really depends on the owner, and I think in some cases you, do, you might use LDAP and SAML, okay? Because the SAML just directs you to a single sign-on. You still have to authentic, you still may authenticate, perhaps, to a, a different server, depending, so. Uh, we've improved the performance. When we first came out with N4, uh, we actually, that the software bill was quite big, and with 4.4, we've seen tremendous improvement in speed that people have asked for, so we've made a mo lot of modifications in 4.4 were things the community wanted. They said, give me faster graphics, give me faster charts, and those sort of things. Uh, we also, d and we did a lot of optimization. Now, you might say that's not adding a lot of features, but it is if you use the system day in and day out. It's really important if you use that, and your end users will appreciate it. Uh, another thing that we did is something called template enhancements, and if, I, I'm going to talk about templates in a little while, but in Niagara, we have this feature, it's called a template. So if I'm a system integrator, and I happen to use a, a, you know, certain KMC controllers I use every day, I can build a template that will automatically have all the backnet points from that KMC controller, I can put a graphic to it, I can put some analytics in it, and I can actually run some PID loops, and every time I see that KMC controller and I click on it and say match that template, all that engineering's done right away. So literally, you, if you take the time to build a template, once you go find that device in the field and click on it, you're building all that literally within a second. So these are super important things in Niagara that a lot of people are not utilizing. We'll talk about more of that. So, but we've added enhancements to that so that if you change a template, say you're somebody like a Bank of America with 3,700 sites, and you want to change the template, every air handling unit in every branch in America, you could go in there and change one template and it would go out to all 3,700 sites and make all those changes. So that's a really powerful tool to be able to do that. We've finally gotten to the HTML5 progression We've been on a journey. We've added certain things. We're not HTML5 in Niagara, but with 4.4, literally the last thing to do with the scheduling uh, and the alarm console. So now you don't have to worry about Java applets coming across. Any user can see anything in the system using standard HTML5 rendering, which is really important. So that's a big feature to be able to do that. And the one thing that we do with every single build, and I'll tell you, it's a lot of effort, <coughs> is cybersecurity. There's a lot of stuff going on today about cybersecurity. One of the big ones that you may not have heard about is this in, in uh, the Middle East where somebody broke into an oil refinery and, and they actually had some cybersecurity issues there. We have a, a really good cybersecurity team, but we spend a tremendous amount of time in testing and working in cybersecurity with every single build. We, super, we really take that very seriously. And to that point, people like the U.S. Navy, people like our customers like Bank of America, like Ford, appreciate that. And they do their own t testing on our systems when they go out. So we test them. You know, in Richmond, Virginia, we have third parties do penetration testing. Then we have a lot of customers that do their own testing. The U.S. Navy has done significant testing. The GSA has done significant testing. So I just want to point, we are 
dedicated to cybersecurity first. That's the first thing we make sure it gets into a build, is anything that has to do with cybersecurity. So, uh, a couple of other features that we're doing on the single sign-on, that's getting to be extremely popular. So what we're going to do is, is allow you, if somebody doesn't have a, their own server, we're going to build in some more IT single sign-on servers built in directly to Niagara. So again, I'm not going to get into the deep side of it, but we're more and more enterprise customers are telling us, well, you have to use the latest authentication schemes that are out there. So we're doing a lot of that. We'll talk about some of these other things like system search and hierarchies later. Uh, I'll show you some demos. People have asked us to do uh, better HTML when it comes to mobile. So we've got some awesome things that we're working on uh, with mobile uh, at the Niagara Summit, which is coming up in April, April 15th in New Orleans. That's the next meeting you should be planning on going to. Uh, we'll have a lot more details about what we're doing with mobile. We're kind of changing the whole way mobile's done. You'll create one graphic, and it doesn't matter what device it goes to. The device will know that I'm an iPhone, or I'm an Android phone, or I'm an iPad, uh, or a Galaxy, and it will automatically create those graphics for you. So the days of doing multiple graphics and views are, are, are going away. So we've heard that. So FIPS is a government standard. A lot of people see out there, so we're putting FIPS... Uh, uh, 140-2 and N4. So s over and over, we're getting all these security standards are coming in. And you have to understand, it's really nice to have beautiful, you know, HTML5. But if you want to st still do business with people, if you don't follow the security standards, you're not going to be on their network or anywhere close to their network. So again, this is becoming very important. But the U.S. government and the Department of Defense have been fantastic partners. So I, I can assure you that they know us and we know them well, so anytime you get into any situation where you're, you're uncomfortable talking to these people, please talk to us about that. It's very, you know, very often we have some very high level conversations with people uh, in, in the federal government and, and can maybe help you get on a base because somebody's concerned about it. So it's really, again, I, can't, I just can't overemphasize how we deal with this every single day. So. So the alarm console update we talked about, now you can have HTML5 alarm console is available. It's much faster. Uh, you can filter and acknowledge. So everything can just be done in the browser. You don't have to, have to worry about opening WorkBrench again. Everything you do in a browser can be, can be done with the HTML5. And it took a while to do that, but alarming and scheduling uh, are very complex systems. The most complex piece of software that we make is scheduling software. You wouldn't think it is, but there's so many nuances to it, it becomes very uh, uh, complicated. Uh, so we have that available today. Uh, we, we've added uh, additional support for new schedules. And what's cool, you can customize it. So if you don't like the colors that we use and schedules and do that, you can just go in there and change this, the colors very much like you might do with Outlook. So you can go in there and make changes to it because it's, it's a pure HTML5 interface. It's very flexible now to be able to do that. Uh, the next thing that we're working on, I want you to be aware of, you'll hear the term a lot that's called system database. And what's happening, everybody here this morning has been talking about the data and everything going up there and the gazillion amounts of points and all that. Well, you know what, we all have to, you know, everybody says they can talk to a gazillion points, but it's a lot harder than it, than it you know, seems. So what we're doing is working on what are we doing to make sure that we can handle a million points in Niagara and do that. So we're spending a lot of time behind the scenes, something that we call system database that is planning for these ma massive systems. We do, we have systems with hundreds of thousands of points and some close to a million points, but it, they're going to get bigger. They're going to get 10 million points are going to be as, as these systems get bigger. So, so that's a term you're going to hear a lot where, you know, your JSON is going to be out in the field. They may go directly to the cloud or they may just go to a server on site. We still, you know, everybody's talking cloud and, and I'm a firm believer in the cloud and it's amazing what I see, how many people are saying they never would go to the cloud and are, but there's still a ton of people that are pure on premise. And I'm still convinced that there's going to be a lots of big on-premise servers that do that, maybe a local cloud. Uh, so some other cool tools that we're working on is we're trying to make it easy. When you go out to a system and you're bringing in, whether it's backnet devices like uh, all the great KMC controllers, or you're bringing in multiple JSs. I mean, more and more, we're having customers that are calling us up and say, you know what? I've got 1,000 buildings, and I'm going to have four or five JSs in every building. We need a way to quickly bring those online and do that. So we're working on this concept of called auto join, where you're going to be able to go out there and by feeding some select data in there, it's going to automatically go out to all these buildings, go find the networks that might be backnet IP type controllers or MSTP controllers and automatically link those into the network without going in there and hitting a bunch of clicks. 
So that, that's something that we're working on. We're going to show you some demos at ASHRAE. If you want to come by and really do a deep dive, we'll talk to you about some of this technology. We're showing it today. It's going to get ready to go in beta. It'll be released at the summit, so uh, in the April-May time frame. So, so what's the idea that auto-join is? It's really kind of cool. What we figured out is so many of these systems are the same. Remember I told you about templates are really cool? Well, suppose your estimating system, I'm going to use Mark and his team at Long, they use a, a consistent estimating system, I'm sure, that all their sales reps use. Well, suppose they look, did a little bit of data and it said, you know what, this job's got a KMC VAV fan power controller and it's my template that says KMC VAV, and the estimator puts that in a spreadsheet or it comes from his estimating system, it dumps it into a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet can now be integrated into Niagara without any workbench being done and it will automatically go down and find that controller that you designated and automatically program it. And we can show you a demo of that at ASHRAE, which is really neat. So think about a job with a thousand VAV boxes. You could have one of your estimators go down through the schedule, change the nuances like the minimum airflow, what room is it in, add some tagging to it, and put it in a spreadsheet. And then we have a new service in Niagara that you auto load and it will automatically go into the station and automatically program that for you. I gotta tell you, it's a really cool, really exciting what we're doing with that type of work right there. So that's something that we call the config update tool. And again, it could be a, it can be an Excel spreadsheet, it could be a web page, but it's this whole idea that we, we want people to be able to use non-engineering tools. If I've done enough planning, and as a company, I do things similar the same way and build templates, you'll be able to do a lot of automated engineering to be able to do that. So same thing goes with certificate management. Now, getting back into the IT side, certificates and certificate management is a pain. It is complex. And, I, and so we're also going to try to automate that procedure so we can have automated certificates so that the JACE can go through the IT network and make sure that that JACE is a trusted source going across the network. So we'll automatically be able to do things like assigning certificates to controllers. So really powerful. The other cool thing that we can do a template on, if you do a building and do, do the same building over and over again, say it's a convenience store or it's a even a library or a pumping station, you can build a template for a JACE, and if you've got a thousand identical JACEs, you can use the same templating and certificate service to do that across JACEs as well. So, so that's 4.6? That's 4.6 will be out <coughs> mid-year, and we're showing it today. Mid, mid this year, absolutely mid this year, and we actually can show, we actually have it running at the booth, so we'd like you to get, give us some feedback on that, but that's soon to go to beta. And what's kind of funny, you have to remember, our, our cycle is, after we stop coding, there's a lot of work to do. Because after you code it, you've got to test it. And that testing also includes security testing. So we, we, it takes, we'll stop building software in the next couple of weeks. And then we have to go through this big testing cycle. Then we have to go through the cybersecurity testing. And then we have to go through beta testing. So that's why I can, we're very comfortable with the dates on this because we know it's code complete. We know we're going to we know we're gonna find some stuff in beta. And we know we'll be able to get it out the door. So, very comfortable with that. Uh, Scott Minch is talking about Haystack. I don't know if you've seen Scott here. He, he is with the Haystack Committee, and he's talking about tagging. Now, what thing we've done, we, we're a firm believer in tagging. We, we're a firm believer in Haystack tagging as well when we've updated that. But we also believe there's more than Haystack. Haystack's a great library for doing tagging. But you know what? Haystack doesn't necessarily work with the elevator community. They're trying to. So there's a lot of other dictionaries out there, industrial dictionaries and tagging. But we just want to let you know that we support Haystack. Uh, the latest release of 4.4 is, you know, they've made some changes to it. So you now can, can put Haystack tags in a JACE. You can put your own company tags in a JACE and use them simultaneously. So it's an import, important point that, that we're supporting that working very closely with that group. So. Uh, another kind of neat module that we've got, some of you might be doing uh, pharmaceuticals. We actually have a new e-signature model. So in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, anytime you command something, change a set point, you've actually got to send the command, but then you have to digitally sign that you did the command. And in some cases, two operators have to put their digital signature in that. So we've actually had a lot of people ask us for that. In specific to, it's specific in pharma and other industries, but we now have a new e-signature model. Uh, uh, so it, it, the module 
uses secure points. It allows you to come in and put your digital signature in, and then you can put some notes in there about what you do. So if you have any, any pharmaceutical plants or you, you need to, to utilize this service, give us a call. It's not for everybody, so we're working it through our professional services because it's just not a standard module that people ask for every day. So what we're doing is, but it is available now, okay? And we've actually done pharma plants with it. You know, we got quite a, we actually have somebody at the summit that's gonna be speaking about the, the, using the e-signature in a pharmaceutical up in the Northeast. So, any of y'all doing pharma work? You do, yeah, you do, so, yeah. Some people have asked for this for many, many years and, and it finally got enough projects that people kept saying we need to do it that we did it. So if you have any questions, uh, come ask us about it. We can talk to you about that as well. So, um, Niagara Cloud. Somebody said, okay, when's Niagara gonna be in the cloud? Well, there's a couple things that we're doing in the cloud. Uh, right now we have something in, if you've used the Niagara community or used our service, we have something we call Asset Manager as a tool where anybody, in, even an end user, can now register in the Niagara community and go look at all their assets. And part of the problem is we have one customer, and you've all seen it, you've gone to a job and another SI has got their JACE there and you can't figure out what the license is and what it does. So what we've actually got now is a place where you can go and as an end user or an SI you can register and you can actually take and bring in all the host IDs for all those systems and have one place to go see them. You can see what the license is, you can see who sold it, you can see what rev it's at. So this started with the GSA who has thousands and thousands of JACEs, okay? And they're like, oh gosh, this one's Distech, this one's Johnson, this one's Vicon. Can I just go to one place and see all my JSONs and say, okay, I want to get all these JSONs revved up to 4.4. And they were the ones, and we, and we actually designed the system to be able to do that. So, so you as an SI, I think, would appreciate the ability to go see a project and see that, but your end users really might. So if you've got an enterprise end user, uh, you know, somebody with a, a big enterprise that wants to be able to manage those, regardless of brand, regardless of SI, they can do that. So, uh, and we call that enterprise licensing management. So the idea is they'll get, you know, your owner will get notifications. By the way, your software's out of date. You know, it's 4.4, it's but now 4.6 is out. So it'll kind of remind them that. It'll also be, a, it's brand agnostic. We don't care. Any brand of Niagara can be registered by, by a user. Uh, details through filters, and I'll show you that. Licensing through single sign-on. And also, as part of this, will allow you to back up your data to the cloud. So that's our real first cloud service is to take a JSON and automatically back up the data to the cloud. So what's really neat about the enterprise licensing data, it'll tell you the brand, the model, the dates, the licensed software version, and software option. Many times if you're not the, say, it's, say you're a KMC dealer and you need info on the DISTEC dealer, you gotta make a phone call, right, to get the data and figure out what it is. You no longer will have to do that. You'll be able to have access to be able to see that. So, and again, a lot of customizable data if you wanna see who the, you know, how you set it up. Um, it'll be done through the Niagara community and I'll tell you how many people know about the, have logged into the Niagara community? in the forms, this is really good stuff here. I mean, you really should, there's a lot of great information there. This is where you trade a lot of info back and forth. So, encourage you to use that. You don't have to be a, a, a dealer to get access to that. We have a lot of consulting engineers and end users that go into the community and, and offer uh, info back and forth. So, so, what's neat about it is if I go in there and say I, I happen to be a, a big end user like a, a college, I can go in there and see all my host IDs. I can see the project name, who the service provider was, so I can see who the heck actually put it in, because a lot of people don't even know who the last person there was. I can see what they're licensed at. So it's an extremely powerful tool for somebody to manage that. So you can set it up for your end user, and you could actually set it up for your own company if you wanted to. But it's a value add. If you can go in there and help your customer wade through all that, I think you're, you're gonna be able to add a really good service to be able to do that. And then you can have certain users to go in there. You don't want everybody to have access to this, but you can set up users and, and uh, only certain people can have access to it. And then you can filter it. Say, okay, uh, you know, what did Scott Yahoo, which is my buddy Scott Dame there, you know, what did he do? You know, what did he do with these licenses? You know, what did this person do with these licenses? So you have a lot of powerful data you can see about what's going on with the licensing. And this, if you want to look at the details of a particular JACE, you can see the host ID, when it expires, what the model was, the name of the project it was originally installed on, licensed software version, and you can also add notes to it. So if the end user, you want to add notes specific to that job, you can add notes and watch that, so. 
And what's really cool is if that's been backed up with the backup service, we'll talk in a minute, you can go view all the backups that were done on that. So they can automatically back up their data. One of the biggest problems we have that SI's told us, they get to a job and the person that was there before never did a backup of the system and nobody knows where it is. I mean, that still happens a lot, it's unfortunate. Now, independently, the JSONs can back up to the cloud and you know that somewhere out in the cloud, regardless, there's a backup. I even had a, a major uh, facility management company tell me, even though they back up their JSONs religiously, they love this idea because it's another backup outside of their own infrastructure. So if something ever happened to their backups and they're good at it, they know they could go to the cloud and get another backup. So, so that brings in backup as a service. So what does it do? It's a 24-7 copy. So if one of your techs shows up on the job, the database is scrambled. If the backup as a service is there, they can get the credentials from who, the owner that set it up and go download a new, new backup instead of starting from scratch, which is very unfortunate that we have people today that don't service customers as well as they should. Well, this eliminates a lot of that issue there. And what's really cool, you can do it with a single J. So in many cases, we have to have a web supervisor to do a backup, right? Well, if you have a single JACE at a church, nobody knows where the backup is, but now you, your customer who might be a small church or very small building can have a single JACE and still get backed up to the cloud. So every, you, know, you basically install the connectivity software in the JACE. There's a service to do that. You go in and, and you set up backups that can be done automatically. You can say weekly or as things change. You get the last known good. They call that the LKG. Configuration is downloaded it, installed onto your workbench and you load it in the JSON. And then the documentation is there. You can go look at how often, it's just like my phone, right? It tells me when's the last time I backed it up, what's the last known good backup, those sort of things. So pretty common to be able to do that. So as a matter of fact, Don here, his company is probably leading the charge with doing the backup as a service. His company has done a bunch of them and uh, for their customers. So just looking at the different people that are using it. So. Some quick questions that we get a lot of people asking is, what's the cost? It's free. If you have a current software li license agreement, there's no charge for the backup. So, what version are compatible is with 4.3 and up, and where's the data stored? We have a lot of people ask that question. It's stored in the Azure cloud, okay, Microsoft. Depending where you're located, it might be a West Coast data center or an East Coast data center. It actually, the JACE goes to the data center that's most appropriate for the location. So it's done that. The data is encrypted in transit and at rest. You use your passphrase to get that data. Okay, so the good news is it's there. So we've got some really good credentials about where it's stored. And then how does it get there? The JACE pushes the data out. Okay, it says, okay, it's Sunday. Let's push the data out and do that. So it's a really nice service, I will tell you. And in a lot of customers, particularly small customers, that's where we see a lot of these issues with never finding the database backup. So any questions on that? Send trends to the cloud also, or only backup? No, no it's, it, all that data goes back. At the, you do a complete backup to the cloud. So your, all your data that's in the database, everything that would be in there, including the trended data, gets pushed up to the cloud. But separately on the trends, no. No, it's all one, it's all one I file. It's all one file, but what if I just want to send only the trends? No, 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 you're going to send a complete backup of the station. Last known good, total backup of the station, right. Now, what you're asking for is phase two, history as a service. Okay. People just want to send the histories up and look and slice and dice histories. That's actually the next phase of this that, that we're actually working on. But the first thing people said is they needed a complete database backup. So. And are you getting notification if it fails? Yes, it? absolutely, yeah. It'll let you know immediately. That's part of the data. If the backup didn't have, you'll, if you look in the setup, it'll have an email address and it'll send you an alarm and say your backup didn't work, okay? And by the way, we give you a certain amount of space, and we found that you're going to probably get about, and this can be a JSON or a supervisor, by the way. Now, supervisor stations are very large. We're going to give you enough. Probably, you're probably going to get about three backups there, and then you're going to run out. So it's always going to use the last known good, right? It's always going to use good data to be able to do that. And a lot of that you can set up yourself. So. Okay. So next, um, I've got to check time here. All right, doing pretty good here. So uh, analytics. Boy, if there's been a buzz in the industry, it's been about analytics, right? IoT, now analytics. So when I, I'm going to discuss today just a little bit about Niagara Analytics, okay? And, and we've been doing analytics for years. You know, when I walk into a chiller room, 
I use this analytic engine up here to go look at stuff and I've got gray hair so somebody wants to figure out how do we take the analytics in Ed's head or a really good chiller mechanic and come up with some rules because these people are retiring, right? So that's really what the basis of analytics is. What are, what are the best rules that, that can be used for a chiller, for a boiler, whatever? So that's really what analytics is all about, the best rules that are out there. So, so what we said, we're, and there's a lot of great analytics engines out there. I mean, Frank, there's tons of them out there, really good ones, people that we know like SkySpark. But the reason we did Niagara Analytics is people said we want, we want analytics that can go, first of all, run in the J's, and we want analytics that are easy to do. So if I'm a tech and I've been to, to tri, uh, Tritium certification, I can drop and drag analytics and not have to write a lot of extensive code. That's the theory behind that. Are we trying to compete with a lot of these other analytic companies like Splunk and others? No, we want to augment that. So first of all, it's, it's not unusual. We, do it, we did a job at the Dubai airport where we're doing some analytics down in the field in the Jaces, and Splunk is the analytic engine for the entire airport. But it's looking at things like schedules of, air, of the airplanes and, and not just facility type stuff. So that's what I want to point out. Analytics can be a mix and match in, in the industry today. But what we're finding is a lot of people stay away from it because it's too much of an investment. And we want to make that easy for people that already know how to use Niagara to be able to do some analytics, some, some low-hanging fruit analytics and move on. So that's the thing behind it. So some of the value propositions are things like data aggregation, fault detection, diagnostics, alerts and trends. And these have been around for a long time. I mean, I've seen analytic jobs and analytic software available for 10 years, really expensive, but it, and only a certain people were doing it. But the whole idea is to try to take some of those, you know, some of the stuff that we understand so that when somebody is looking at an air hailing unit and figured out that the, that the hot water valve is leaking, can we, can we use some machine learning and analytics to figure that out? And we know we can do that. So, so, so the integrated analytics 2.0 is, is really the idea is, first of all, it comes free. You get 25 points of analytics with every Jason, and every supervisor. It just, it's there. So if you want to do some analytics, you want, we wanted people to say to get comfortable. We didn't have to worry about buying anything. You just go in there and there's some points there, so it doesn't cost me anything to try it. The other thing we said, we don't charge you any, any upgrade uh, SMAs for the, for the maintenance. If you buy your standard maintenance agreement, the maintenance for the analytics comes along for the ride. Uh, so, so we've got analytics graphics, and, and the thing that you, you may have heard of tagging is so important because all analytics is is an engine that goes out and looks at all these devices that have been named with a certain tag, and it runs some rules against it. It's not super complex if it's all done right. That's why Haystack is trying to get everybody in the world to use the same tags, right? So if I go to a job in Denver and another job in New York, okay, and it's two, two different companies, if they're tagged the same and everything's named properly, I can run some analytics and it doesn't matter who the manufacturer was, who the SI was, I can run some analytics against it. So again, the idea is we're trying to leverage that and support the tagging scheme. Even if you don't use our analytics, I suggest you use our tagging scheme if you're pushing it to somebody else, okay? It's very common for us to use tags and push it up to SkySpark, right? A lot of people are doing that. I, there's a lot of people in this room that are doing that, okay? However, we want you also to be able to say in the Jace to run an analytic engine like a SkySpark and, and be able to put that in a small church, okay? And we also are encouraging to build it in your templates. I think KMC's done a great job. There's a lot of smarts in the KMC controller. I mean, I think they were building in analytics before anybody else was. But we want to encourage people to build it at a much lower level. So that's kind of the theory behind that. What we've done is we're building out an analytics library. We're taking some of the best practices like what about if I've got simultaneous heating and cooling going on? What about if I have a leaking valve? So we've taken some of those things that are in the library. And the whole idea is these rules are drop and drag rules. That's how we're trying to get to it. What about low delta T in a chiller plant? We want to be able to drop and drag a block on there and automatically we're just doing analytics on, on low delta T. That's, the, that's really what our vision is. And we'll continue to build out these libraries. We've been working with a lot of our partners to to get some of those rules and license those rules that have done a very good job at doing that. So my take on this, the best rules win. Analytics is just an engine. It's the rules that are the most important, right? I've got the best chiller rules. I'm going to sell the best chiller rules to you. And if you take people like, the, like Dakin or Carrier or Train or whatever, they know, the, they know a lot about their chillers and they build you know, rules in there, okay? So again, the rules are, and you all in this room have tremendous experience, all this gray hair, right? Everybody's already learned how stuff has been broken. So we could write rules 
And that's what's going to happen. All, uh, you know, we know that some of the best chiller technicians in the world are going to retire here soon. So can we get all the information from them and build some rules around it? Because they're going to retire, and the, and the younger technicians haven't you know, made those same mistakes yet. So, so that's kind of what we're thinking about, is keep building out these rules and let the community add rules. If you want to add rule to Niagara, you can build your own rules and, and put them right in the library. So we're trying to make that universal. So a sample algorithm, you know, might be, you know, you know, it's I really just want to know what my usage per square foot is across a thousand buildings, okay? And I just want to give me alarm when my usage per square foot automatically goes up somewhere. And that's easy to do in a JACE. We can do that today without analytics. But what about if I have a thousand sites? Oh, crap. That's a lot of clicks, right? So the whole idea is if it's tagged right, we go out to those thousand JACEs pull that data up and run that one analytic rule, and it tells me where within a thousand sites I've got a problem with energy. That's the whole idea behind analytics. And in a, in a sample algorithm like that is really just you know, pre-done, you drop it on the sheet, you link it to your existing system and do that. That's kind of where we're headed with Niagara Analytics. Same thing might be for a VAV damper open too long. If I've got a VAV damper that's open for 100% for four hours, it's probably a problem not getting good static pressure, I don't have a right temperature. Well, that's okay. Again, it's easy to do with one VAV box, but when you're in Chicago, where the, probably the average is 1,000 VAV boxes per building downtown, that's a pain to do all that type of algorithm. So, so the idea is, can I build this, and if all my VAV dampers, all my KMC VAV controllers are using the same terminology for set point and for flow, I can do that. So, again, the whole idea is trying to make it so it just works on the wire sheet without any additional programming. So, just some of the key takeaways, you know, we're, we're trying to jumpstart the, the, the deployment with, the, with electrical and, and energy usage in HVAC. Haystack support, okay, we do want to, we, we'll, we'll support all types of tagging. And again, we have a lot of training available to do it, but I know it's a learning curve. But sooner or later, we're all going to have to learn how to use analytics because it's coming, right? So. so, the next thing I want to do is talk to you about, so where do I learn more about analytics? How can I go see it? Uh, we actually have a, a really nice new uh, demo site that we've created for the, for the community to use. And what we've done is we've built the station. It's got a lot of analytics examples. We've given you a lot of walkthroughs. So you can actually go play around and run, a, run an analytic alarm and see what happens online. So we did this for people to go learn and demo. We want consulting engineers, whatever. So just to let you know, that site is called niagarafordemo.tritium.com. You sign in with demo. In the password, Niagara123. Okay, so uh, we want you to go up there. We want you to go look at it. We want your engineers to look at it. And, and you know, it's also a great demo site if you're a salesman. I've had several salespeople come up and say, you know, I really would like some help on, on, on selling and, and that. And I said, well, look, we've got some great demo sites. And if you go up there and follow through it, you'll learn how to sell not only Niagara, you'll learn how to sell analytics, you'll learn how to sell building automation and energy aggregation as well. So again, Basically, how it works is you just go in and log in, and you're going to come up with a site that looks like this, and guess what? The demonstration details, download that first. That's a PDF file, and uh, you were asking me because you, you're kind of new to Niagara and that. That's the first thing you want to do. If you just read that document, you're going to become really, hey, well, wow, you're going to learn a lot about Niagara and learn about selling building automation systems. Then we also have some tags in there you can search. So there's a lot of great info. And everywhere along the way where there's an information box, it's going to tell you about the demo and what we're trying to do. So this is, it's really an awesome site. We have a full-time person, Rick Weisenthal, in our office, who's a great resource, who spends full-time managing this. So there's some tremendous information here that we've made available. So. so you can go up here, and if you click on the map view and say, look, you know what, I want to look at the average daily profile. So there's a Niagara analytic that's going out there to all the buildings in this system, and all it's doing is saying things like KW. So it's just taking all the KW points, and it says, I know this one's in Richmond, Virginia, and I know it, it's, it goes up to Virginia and the West Coast and does energy aggregation. And, uh, and again, this is a little video of the different things you can do. And again, that if you go into the PDF file, it'll show you how you go in there and, and what's going on. But you can see it live and see how the system works. And again, data aggregation is a big part of energy analytics. Because again, we could write code that says add this and add this and add this, but if they're named right and we know what city they're in, like geography-wise, we can say, go get me all the energy in the state of Virginia. Go get me all the uh, energy data for O'Hare Airport. 
right? And what it does is anything that's tagged O'Hare, O'Hare Airport and it's KW, it goes out there and it adds it all up for you. So it's basically taking a lot of coding out of there just by writing a couple of simple rules to be able to do that. Uh, just some average profile. Another one might be the area normalized. We talked about, you know, taking area normalized energy. KW per square foot is probably a lot more important than the total KW. Okay, so there's a lot of different things you can do with these reports just by the click of a button, and the analytics will, are already built in, actually. You, you, can, you can set up baselines against that, you could, and you, again, that comes into your tagging. Do you want to make that a special tag where you're going to run a different statistical rate? You know, you might run some, some very high-level statistics, like people like Splunk do and things of that sort, where you're going to, going to look for some statistical issue. Why are, and I'll, we have a customer who did this, a bank, that utilize early analytics to figure out why are a certain brand of heat pump in the South doing so much better than another brand. So they actually use brand as a tag. Okay, so you know it's a carrier, you know, heat pump or, or Dakin or whatever. That's really important data to do energy analysis if you're managing a building. Am I really getting my money's worth from this particular manufacturer? But maybe I'm and what this bank said, certain manufacturer in hot climates were much better than the cold climate. So they made the buying decisions based on analytics. Now this was done years ago before we did it or a lot, it was real popular, but a company did those analysis for them. You're saving tremendous amounts of money doing that. So um, some of the other things you can do, again, when, once you do some of this aggregation, you can do the spectrum charts, which basically is taking all the energy data, KW, and putting it across a time period. Uh, and you can actually, you know, change the color and say, you know what, give me a one-year view and just show me where the outliers are for high energy use. You know, this is a standard week here, but guess what? It's hard to find outliers. How do I find a building that's running on Sunday when it shouldn't do that? Analytics can do that for you. That thing could be, you know, those are the kind of outlier information you want to use analytics to go data mine for you. So, and these are things we did years ago manually, but now it's done automatically. Now, if any of y'all use the Vicon Energy Suite, I know the folks at Long have done a ton of it over the years, that it, it's something that we did manually. Somebody manually analyzed these reports. Now it's done automatically because all this is going out and, and fetching the data and aggregating it properly. So, relative contribution, I'm going to go. Uh, um, the other thing you can do that's really cool, if you go to one of the floor plans, you can actually go in there and by changing the sun intensity on the building, it'll actually run an algorithm. This is a VAV algorithm that basically says if I have any VAV box over 80% for a certain period of time, increase the static pressure, right? Or if that doesn't help, then lower the dis discharge temperature. So you can actually watch it operate. And so the whole idea of this is really not as only to demo, it's to educate people on what analytics can do for you. And this is a real time, it'll show that, you know, that the, you know, this damper position went to 80, 87% because the sun intensity got higher. But then you can watch the analytic raise the static pressure temperature in real time and watch the VAV boxes get back into control. Which is, and that's hard to really define, that's why people have a hard time grasping what analytics is. But if you show this to somebody, they understand it. I once had a school district, I was, I was talking all about analytics and tagging. And then when I told the example of leaking hot water valves or simultaneous heating and cooling, he says, oh, that's what analytics is. It finally hit that they have problems with leaky valves and, and simultaneous heating and cooling. He said, if that's analytics, that's what I need. And I'm dumb, he's going, it took me an hour. I should have just said that right at the beginning, right? So, uh, and what's really cool, you can click on the algorithm worksheet and actually see what the worksheet looks like. So this is really a nice tutorial for, for building automation and analytics, so. Uh, this is kind of a cool one. The, the, uh, the idea that we have simultaneous heating in uh, like a leaking chill water valve or, or le leaking hot water valve. Oh, bear with me just a minute. I think I went too fast. What happens is in the analytics, if we have a, a, a hot water valve that's leaking, we'll actually show that. We'll send you an email out there, but we'll also show it to you on a chart. Look, look at this spike here. This is a leaking hot water valve and point that out, okay? So... Uh, the other one is you can actually go in there and you can actually change what type of analytics run and then watch the sequence go through what it does with the analytics. And what's really neat about this is it'll also do an alarm. And if you see, it'll, you'll see all the, the, the stuff change and it'll go up here and go to the alarm summary and it'll send an alarm. It says, by the way, your box is starving. This box is 
can't maintain temperature. It's not the VAV box's problem, right? It's because I don't have enough chill water, okay, or I don't have enough uh, 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 discharge air temperature is not low enough. How many times you get called for high heat and it's not the VAV box, but it took you two hours to figure out it's not the VAV box, it's the friggin' air handling unit. That's what this tells you. It says, by the way, the space temperature is high, the VAV box is trying to do everything it can do. It's not the VAV box. It's something else. It's the discharge temperature. That's where analytics is really very powerful, those types of examples. And I think this does a really good job of kind of explaining what you can do with analytics. So I encourage you to go, to, go see that, uh, that demo. So. Now the other thing I want to do is talk about tags. And this is really cool. In Niagara, you can do this today. If you tag your data, it's like doing a Google search. Now, some of y'all have done some massive jobs, right? And how many graphics have you got? How many do you have at the uh, airport? How many graphics are in that? Yeah. So what happens is somebody's got to go through those. But suppose you could just do Google search and said, if I tag this stuff right, Terminal 1, Delta, Air Handler 5, boom, and the data came up. So this whole idea is if we tag the data properly, you can go into the search side of Niagara and go find data quickly. And a lot of operators have told me they get sick and tired of navigating through graphic trees. They're really sick and tired of it. They just want to be able to put a quick search in there, take me to the data and do that. And that's a built-in uh, neat feature of Niagara that you can put the search terms if you do the tagging right. Without doing any analytics, just doing the search terms are great. Go carry me to put carrier in there. And all of a sudden, all the carrier equipment comes up, OK? Maybe I'm the carrier tech, and I'm just trying to go to the job and see, show me all the carrier stuff that I'm supposed to maintain. So, you can, so there's a lot of cool things you can do with the tagging and the search and doing the search terms. So what it does is immediately takes you to, to wherever you want to go without having to navigate if you've got thousands and thousands of graphics, which people have. So. Now, theoretically, you have an alarm. It'll bring you up to that graphic, but sometimes somebody calls you on the radio. I'm sitting out here at sump pump 58 do some search and go right to that data. It's just a quick way to do that. Cole's going to talk to you a little bit about networking. And you know, to date, a lot of systems are going on the customer's networks. But what we're starting to see is a lot of customers saying, you know what, I want you to provide me a network, and I want you to make the case to have a separate operational technology network instead of IT. So Nicole is going to, going to talk to you about that now. We're one of those people pushing to work with end users and their IT departments and getting onto their networks. Well, now we're seeing that it didn't do you guys any justice, especially with these IT networks flattening out and going IP. When you look at a Division 25 spec, you're looking at you know, the, the integrated automation platform. You're looking at the brains of your system. You're looking at um, subsystems, hardware, software, everything else. You can't just go out and put a spec of, Tritium or Commander or anything like that, you have to actually be smart about this. So what I'm saying here is the basic concept in your buildings is you have to have the brain and you need to have the backbone to support it all. So let's start with the brain. So in the brain, you have your main server, you have your IoT software, your firewall and DNS, your UPSs, your server racks, everything that you need to support your system. Well, you know, when you're working with your end users, they have their own equipment and their ways of doing things. Well, sometimes it's not secure enough for you. And you need to make sure that you're protected on a daily basis and making sure that your system is cyber secure. So now you need to become the interrogator. Start either making decisions of creating your own networks or interrogating these IT departments and making sure that you're going to be protected. And then you get into the spine of the whole system. So what am I saying here? So I'm sorry this is kind of small for you guys, um, but basically what we're talking about here is we're working with a company called OptiGo. And what it's doing is it's optical splitting with fiber networks. And with the fiber networks and what we think in doing this and creating your own network here is you're going to be able to control the way that you're tapping into these networks, the way you're splitting them into your buildings. You have the um, edge switches where you can assign MAC addresses. So if someone tries to pull a plug and put their own thing in there, the MAC addresses won't match and they won't be able to get into your network. You know, um, and all these devices that are turning to IP, you have, you know, 
um, the, the conquest controllers, you have your commander system, you have the KMC BACnet routers, which is a fantastic tool for your net, BACnet networks. You can have a whole building of your 485 networks, add your KMC BACnet routers, the BAC 5051E, and you have all your now your 485 diagnostics for addressing and everything, and now you can take that IP directly to a server, running Niagara or anything like that of your choice. And now you have less steps to get to the head end or the cloud or whatever your final goals are, or you have and you have less parts to maintain as well. Um, <clears throat> and also with this, where we're realizing, you know, um, and we're working with engineers and helping them do these specs to lay them out to make sure that you have. The, the head end, the firewall, the protection from the outside world or even the end users network and users throughout those networks. And then from there you can lay out your different UPSs, your switches throughout the network and how to split them. And the nice part about using the optical splitting is you can split them any which way. You can T-tap into the fiber backbone anywhere, you can split them off, you can do your daisy chain cascading with your IP controllers, you know, anything that you may need to do within the building. So, us at Copper and Supply are now learning how to create these Division 25 specs and making sure that we're specking your own networks and things like that. Now, don't get me wrong, you're going to have end users out there that you're going to collaborate with them and you're going to be on their networks. You got the Fords and the, you know, the few banks or you know, different platforms that you're going to end up working with them, but make sure you're being smart about it. How am I protected? What happens if you guys get an attack? How are they going to get to my equipment? Things like that. And so what we're trying to teach the industry is to let's be smarter about these networks. Because as they flatten out to all IP devices, which from all these meetings and IOTs of everything, we're seeing that it's coming and it's coming quickly. So you're going to see your networks just flatten out and all IP and now you need to protect that. You don't have those different layers to get into the serial networks where it was a little bit harder for people back in the day. What did you say the name of the company is that you're working with? And are they a local company or are they national? Um, they're they're um, all over. They're, the company name is Optigo. Um, they, will, they will be at the ASHRAE as well if you guys will be out there. Um, and you can also feel free to contact us. We can help you lay out any specs or anything like that to understand the buildings more. Um, and that's really it. So, Nicole, what percentage are you, so you're seeing people that really want you off the corporate network in most cases, now well, you're starting to see a trend that way? We're seeing a lot of partners that don't want to be on the end users networks. You know, um, you know, that they'd rather get one IP address from the end user and that IT department maintain that one IP address that they're familiar with what's coming through that port. You know, because these IT guys, they don't know what controllers do. They don't know what I, you know, the sensors may be doing. And if they're in the building and they notice some noise from it and they don't know what it is, they can shut it off. And then what's going to happen to your building? You know, it could have been an important free stat or, you know, something like that and it creates huge issues. So, you know, and these IT guys are not going to always learn all these IP devices in those networks. So to protect your projects and your IP devices, you know, we're seeing it, more people are asking, how do we get off these networks or how do we protect ourselves? And this is kind of what we're thinking is, you know, working with Division 25 and the integrators and creating your own networks, being secure and understanding it. And, you know, anywhere from the server racks to DNS to everything down, you guys can do very easily. You have control of it. And, you know, if, the end, if something happens, you can turn it over to the end user and they can work with the next guy still. So you're not creating a proprietary system or anything. You're still working with open systems, but you're just creating one point of contact for that IT group in that building instead of a whole network of IP addresses. And one comment to that, it used to be a lot of people did their own networks because you never had a choice. The IT said, no way, no how. Mm -hmm. This is actually a little more structured to it. And I think people would appreciate, particularly nonprofits that don't have a sophisticated IT department, they want you to handle those specifics Right. Right. And then they'll give you, like you said, that one IP address that makes a lot of sense. And I've even seen uh, some other partners who are using the same system saying they, they, they have even entered a within their own company 
the facilities people and the IT people, the IT people said, facilities, it's yours, and you own that network, and you do everything, and I'm going to give you one point of entry. But you better make sure that everything is done right. And then the, the IT people only have to worry about the, the, that one point where something could happen, right? right? They can firewall it, they can do whatever, or sometimes they may not even let it connect. It may go out somewhere else. That it, the this becomes a total standalone network, yeah, and and that's it. You log into it separately. You have you know separate access to the internet with it. That kind of thing. Absolutely.